Well, good evening, everybody. I'm David Eisner, currently the president of the Physiological Society, and I'd like to welcome you all, both those of you in this room and those hopefully watching online, to the Society's headquarters, Hodgkin Huxley House. It's a real pleasure to introduce Dennis Noble to give his lecture. Probably Dennis needs no little or no introduction to most of you in the audience. He did his first degree at University College London, then his PhD on ionic currents in the heart with Otto Hutter. It was there he produced the first computer simulation of the cardiac action potential, an area which he's made massive contributions to ever since. Indeed, I think you could argue that this work really makes him one of the founders and the fathers of the discipline of systems biology. Having done that, he moved to Oxford, where he's worked ever since. In the landmark series of papers, he characterised the repoling, repolarizing potassium currents in the heart, and with this work, established a framework for analysis of such data, which is still used to this day. In parallel with this experimental work, he's produced a series of models of the electrophysiology of the heart, and from this played a major role in the establishment of the Physiome project, with the eventual goal of modelling the whole of human physiology. I first met Dennis in the late 1970s when I began graduate studies in his laboratory and learnt an enormous amount from him. Dennis's interests, as we'll discover, aren't limited solely to physiology. As we'll hear in his lecture, he's contributed greatly to the understanding of genetics and evolutionary biology. He also has interests in philosophy, and all these combined with a talent for languages makes him a real Renaissance man. Not surprisingly, he's had many honours. He's a fellow of the Royal Society, commander of the British Empire, as well as having honorary degrees from several universities. As well as his own work, he's made many other contributions to the world of science and learning. He was Secretary of the Physiological Society, Secretary General and currently President of the International Union of Physiological Sciences. He played a major role in the 1980s, it was at a time when the, in the UK the government was making major cuts in science funding. Dennis and colleagues founded the organisation Save British Science, which this year is celebrating its 30th anniversary under its new name, the Campaign for Science and Engineering. I won't speak any longer. It's much more important you listen to Dennis, and I'd like to invite him to give his lecture, Dance to the Tune of Life, A Physiologist Enters the Lion's Den of Evolutionary Biology. Dennis. Well, this is the real performance, the rehearsal for which was done before an audience of 300 at the Royal Society and the British Academy um, last week. And a great part of the lecture today will be based on what I gave as a presentation at that meeting. <laughs> And I want first to pay tribute to one of the greatest developmental biologists ever, Conrad Waddington, who wrote a book in 1957 called Strategy of the Genes. It's so important that it's very recently been reprinted as a new edition in 2014, and it stands the test of time. Conrad Waddington was one of the first to show how you could demonstrate the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And we'll come on to that topic a bit later. I also want to thank Cambridge University Press, um, the publishing editor relevant to this particular event is here tonight, who've managed to produce the first copy of Dance to the Tune of Life um, to give to me tonight. So I'm delighted that that at last has come out. Now, the lecture will be to compare two approaches to evolutionary biology and to biology generally. The 20th century reductive approach, which looked at the evolutionary process as blind chance variations that have no directionality in them in the genome, followed by natural selection, in which case evolution has no foresight. The watchmaker indeed was blind. 
The alternative approach, which I'm going to present to you today, is to turn all of that on its head. Yes, there is randomness. There can't be other than randomness, because biological molecules will be subject to kinetic energy just as any other molecules are. And the important point, and this is one of the big take-home messages of this lecture, is that organisms use that randomness in order to generate functionality. That turns the classical dogma on its head. And that means also that evolution can be directional. We'll come on to that conclusion towards the end. So I'll first discuss ways in which organisms harness stochasticity. Second, how in so doing they're capable of reorganizing genomes in response to stress. And then to the inheritance of non-DNA information, which was what Conrad Waddington showed many years ago, the role of what I call genetic buffering, which is in fact my own and my own group's way into this particular story, as you will see, because it's based on some of the work we did many years ago. Finally, the role of physics in development. So my question, the main question, is going to be this. How did the integrative physiological approach become sidelined in the 20th century? And I think the answer is that we were attracted, we I say, because many of us were too. Physiologists became attracted to this mantra just as much as other biologists from molecules to man. And notice the directionality in that, a one-way process. And the problem is this cannot be true. Molecules are simply not alive. How did we get into this problem? It arose, well you can trace it all the way back to René Descartes in his um, treatise on the fetus way back in 1665, which was published after his death. But you can trace it through Laplace, through to Schrödinger, and it's Schrödinger's book, classic book, What is Life, published in 1943, which um, lays out the idea and we'll come on to that now, that whereas physics is order from disorder, you have the stochasticity of gas molecules at the molecular level, but you've got, in a container at least, provided there is a constraint, you've got ordered thermodynamic laws at the high level. So he said physics is the generation of order from disorder. And then he said, Biology, by contrast, has to be the generation of order from molecular order. And why was that? And that's because he made one prediction which is absolutely correct, which is that the genetic material, remember nobody knew in 1942 when he gave those lectures that genetic material was DNA, but he predicted that the genetic material when it was found, would be found to be what he called a non-periodic crystal. And if you think of a linear polymer, which is what DNA is, without complete repeats, of course there are many repeats in, in DNA, as we well know, but they're not complete. You'd, if, if I gave this lecture just giving the same sentence every time, I'm going to give the same sentence every time, and so on, you would be pretty disappointed. The genome is not like that, it's clearly got information in it. But you see, I think he went then further. If it is like a crystal, remember these are the days of X-ray crystallography to determine molecular structure, then there could be a determinant readout, and that's the beginning of the one-way determinant readout process. It is, of course, what led to the central dogma of molecular biology. Watson and Crick both acknowledge um, uh, Schrödinger as a great influence on their ideas when they discovered the double helical structure of DNA. So the question is, could biology generate order from order? And I've already given a hint that, that can't possibly be true. There is absolutely no way in which the molecules in a biological system can be immune from or not affected by the randomness that comes from possessing kinetic energy. And so the alternative view, which is the one that I outlined in 
the book that I published ten years ago, um, where I regarded life as a process not fully programmed at the molecular level. I used music as a metaphor because music also is a process and the view I expressed in that book was that indeed physics is order from disorder but so also most of the time is biology because stochasticity is a key feature of gene expression. And since that book was published we've come to realize just how extensive and how effective that is. So let's look at harnessing stochasticity. This is from the work of Huang and his colleagues published in Nature just a few years ago, looking at the extent of stochastic expression in a population of cells expressing a particular protein. It doesn't matter which protein you take. You'll find um, stochastic expression for all proteins in neighboring cells. The heterogeneity is actually quite extraordinary. The range in this case is 1,000 fold. Now the interesting thing about this is that that distribution is a population level attractor. It's not determined by individual cells because the population, first of all, on the right there shows the same distribution as it were permanently over many weeks. The second is that if you clone either from the outliers, and I'll see whether this pointer works, um, here we are, yes, if you clone from the outliers in a monomodal distribution or from one of the peaks in cells that show a bimodal distribution, you initially find that the daughter cells inherit the expression level of the parent. But after just a week, you're back to the original distribution. And that is a property of the population. The population is communicating to give you that particular distribution. So organisms or their cellular populations can determine the stochastic variability in the expression of a protein. That's step one in the demonstration. Now step two is to show that that stochasticity is actually used by organisms functionally and what we now know is that it provides a range of expression in order to enable organisms to respond to stress. And the question then would be, if that is so, and I'll demonstrate that it is, how then do cells feed that information to control the genome? Well, first of all, how they do it, we now know as physiologists how they do it. There are many um, articles that I could have taken. I've naturally taken one uh, from one of my former collaborators in that work on the potassium currents that David referred to earlier, Dick Chen. Um, what he and his collaborators did was to show how a micro domain of calcium just beneath a calcium channel can then trigger a cascade of molecular events which then gets transported all the way down through microfilaments to the right part of the nucleus to feed the information on that microdomain. Now that's extremely important. It means that even the micro level uh, information on, in this case, the distribution of calcium is, as it were, known to the nucleus. There is, as it were, a roadway well, we know, of course, uh, how that's done, the little motors that transport the information down uh, to the, the nucleus. So, can this information that the in system can pick up and transmit to its genome enable organisms to respond to stress? The answer is yes. And the first example I'm going to take is the somatic hypermutation in immune system cells. Now I want to say a word or two before I come on to demonstrating the significance of uh, somatic hypermutation to Im indicate a very important part of the lecture which is this. I am certainly not going to deny what the neo-Darwinists would claim is absolutely central to their theory which is that mutations can be random. 
you would be crazy to pretend otherwise. But what I am going to claim is this, that that's not how the functionality comes in. The functionality comes in through the targeting of that mutation um, point on the genome, because it is not targeted everywhere. If it was, there would be no functionality. You would destroy the organism. So let's have a look at how that happens in the immune system. Some of you will know this much better than me because you will know much more about immunology than I do. The way in which it happens, of course, is that in the um, coding for the immunoglobulins that are involved, there are great chunks of the molecule that do not change. There is, though, a region of the molecule where the mutation rate in response to um, antibodies will produce, sorry, to antigens, uh, will enable the production of a huge range of antibodies to cope with the stress. And it is the targeting of that which is where the functionality comes in. Now, um, that particular um, image comes from this lovely review uh, by Odegaard and Schatz uh, where they point out precisely what I'm saying that the somatic hypermutation needs to be targeted specifically to immunoglobulin genes not everywhere in the genome and moreover only to the part of the immunoglobulin genes that is variable so what is happening here is a little bit like a fruit machine. If you hold the wheels of a fruit machine constant because you've already got your two lemons and you want another lemon or an orange or whatever it might be, what do you do? You hold those two and you spend a few coins to spin the other wheel until hopefully you get an orange and that's precisely what the immune system is doing. It's holding great chunks of the immunoglobulin coding regions of the genome constant to enable just the variable part to be spun around. And moreover, the rest of the genome is held constant too. The functionality is coming in through the targeting. It's not through the stochasticity itself. It's using the stochasticity, of course, to find a solution which is precisely uh, how hypermutation works. The difference from fruit machine is that evolution usually wins. <laughs> we don't. So, how did the possibility of rearrangement of genomes um, become understood and that it was possible? One of the key re uh, responses of neo-Darwinist supporters at the Royal Society meeting last week was, well, we've known most of this for a long time. Indeed, we have. 70 years. Because Barbara McClintock discovered the possibility of mobile genetic elements way back in the 1930s and 1940s when she was working on Indian corn. And she found that again in response to stress on the organism, in this case a plant, that great chunks of, well she wouldn't have been able to call it the genome in those days, but great chunks of the chromosomes can move from one chromosome to another. It's that uh, mobile. She was told in 1957 that her work was not believed and she stopped publishing on that very important topic until 30 years later when it became quite clear that mobile genetic elements were all over the place. She was awarded the Nobel Prize at the age of 81. There's hope for all of you. <laughs> And in her Nobel Prize lecture, she wrote this extraordinary statement that we will, in relation to the genome, come to a greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive organ of the cell. Why did she say that? Because it's responding to stress. It's sensing that the organism is in trouble. And it's saying to the organism, just like the hypermutation in the immune system, please find me a solution. The wheel is turning to find the solution. 
And again, it's not turning everywhere. It's turning in the relevant parts of the genome. She says responding to them, often by restructuring the genome. She had to say, of course, in 1983, we know nothing, however, about how the cell senses danger and instigates responses to it. We now do know that, and some very good physiological analysis, as I've just shown, has enabled us to understand that. Did it happen in evolutionary history? The answer is yes. In the sequencing of the genome, um, first published in draft form in 2001 in Nature, there was a very important comparison between yeast, worm, fly, various vertebrates, and human. Enough of the genomes <coughs> was known then to make these comparisons, and in particular on the chromatin proteins uh, and some other proteins, but I'm just going to take the results from chromatin proteins. And what this is showing in this slide is how the proteins change as it was you go from yeast to higher organisms, uh, this one going all the way through to the human, and another one here. And what is also showing, and these, this is of course just a diagram of the various protein domains coded by the genome, is that many of those changes are whole domains of the genome that have moved around, just as Barbara McClintock showed all those years ago. I'm putting stars up to show how many of them there are. This is utterly different from the standard neo-Darwinian hypothesis that you've got gradual accumulation of point mutations until finally you've got a new characteristic. Why? Come back to what the um, hypermutation story tells you, which is that if you allow a whole functional part of a protein to be used in another way, you get functionality. Um, the way I think about this is this. Suppose you give two children um, either the original Lego bricks where you have to painstakingly put together an arch or whatever it might be in order to construct a piece of architecture. And to the other child, you give preformed bricks, as in the bottom left there, and you ask them to construct a bridge. That is, incidentally, a Lego bridge. It is blindingly obvious that the child, given the preformed structures, will get there vastly faster. And that's what nature has done in the evolutionary process, and that's precisely what the sequencing of the human genome in comparison <coughs> with other species shows must have happened in evolutionary history. So, now we come to the question, can we, we've seen it in evolutionary history, can we see it in real time in evolutionary process? And of course you've got to go to very simple organisms in order to do that, because you need to be able to observe a large number of generations. This is from a um, very recent paper in PNAS um, looking at multinucleated bacterial filaments. And I've highlighted the, rap the, the relevant part of the text of the article. It's highlighting the rapid evolution of genome change in response to unfavorable environments. Um, the, incidentally, this of course is why we're facing a crisis with antibiotics the ability to do this is precisely what's giving us a scare. Here's another very lovely example because it involves work done in the University of Reading by Louise Johnson and her colleagues. I'm not even sure whether they themselves realize the full significance of what they've done. I've read the paper and I'm not totally sure that they understand. But they do say that after deleting the relevant DNA sequence that enables the organism to have flagelli and therefore to swim around, so you've then got bacteria without flagelli, that within four days the response to that stressful environment is to restore the flagelli. And it's done so by using a different gene cum regulatory network because it's the combination of the two that is important and once again what is happening is hypermutation, rapid mutation, it would have to be to do that in four days in order to find a solution and that is of course why as I said earlier we've got a scare with antibiotics and bacteria. Um, 
the, this is from another paper also published very recently. I want to make a comment on the uh, mantra that was produced at the Royal Society meeting last week, which is we've known all of this for a long time. That is absolutely true in relation, obviously, to Barbara McClintock's work. It goes all the way back to the 1930s and 40s. And it's obviously true in relation to the mechanisms that Conrad Waddington demonstrated, because that goes back um, 60 years. But there is a veritable flood of information on the precise molecular mechanisms by which all of this is happening and which I think destroys the simple view that it's just accumulation of point mutations over time. Um, this one is looking at ribosomal uh, DNA amplification, pointing out, and the italics are mine, that cells possess specific mechanisms to optimize their genome in response to the environment. There's also now a testable general theory for this, because of course what you've now got to do, and as physiologists I think we have a lovely opportunity here, is how, as Barbara McClintock indicated, does the genome respond to stress? It has to be by those mechanisms that I indicated earlier on, for how the cell manages to communicate to its genome when it is under stress or where various things have changed. This particular a group, um, Yoav Soen and his colleagues at the Weizmann Institute in Israel have produced just such a theoretical structure and shown how the hypothesis can be tested experimentally. Now I want to move on having established that organisms can control their genomes to the extent that they harness stochasticity, the blind chance is there all right, but harnessed to produce functionality in a physiologically significant way to how other mechanisms work to achieve the same kind of result in organisms like you and me. Because an obvious response to demonstrating all of this in bacteria is, okay, but what happens in humans? What happens in organisms as complicated as us? The answer is, of course, that over long periods of evolutionary time, as the sequencing of the genome in 2001 shows, there has to have been genome reorganization. But we can't demonstrate that in real time, and certainly not in humans. What we can show, though, is that other mechanisms for transmitting characteristics that have been acquired in the course of the life of the organism can be transmitted and there are many examples now. The usual response to me <coughs> or others, because I'm certainly not alone in pointing these things out, in fact there's not much in this lecture that is attributable to me particularly as a researcher. There's one element which I'll come on to in the next part of the lecture it's the my, and it was my entry into this area. But the usual response of orthodox evolutionary biologists to all of this is, well, yes, there is epigenetic marking of the genome, but it doesn't get passed on through the generations, and when it does, it rapidly dies out. Well, it doesn't always. This is from a lovely study published in Cell by Harvey and his colleagues looking at um, the nematode worm C. elegans, in which they investigated the mechanism by which the worm can respond to a viral invasion. There are not many, <coughs> excuse me, there are not many viruses that can infect nematode worms, but this particular one triggers an RNA-dependent viral silencing response. And what they did was then very clever. They took worms from that population and crossed them with wild-type C. elegans, some of which would have the DNA to make that RNA and some of which do not. And then as you go down through the generations, of course, you will eventually end up with some worms that have the DNA and some that do not. But they will all be offspring from worms that had the acquired characteristic. They all inherit the viral silencing response. And Harvey and his colleagues show exactly how that is done. RNAs are going down through the germline and the response is therefore transmitted across the generations and it is amplified by RNA polymerase. 
So although you transmit only a small quantity of RNA down through the germline, you amplify it up so that every generation... They followed this for a hundred generations. It dies out? No. It does sometimes. And moreover, I think that epigenetic mechanisms that show transience are an advantage in evolution. You can see why, because it gives the organism... <coughs> excuse me. It gives the organism the possibility of experimenting with an environmental challenge, but then, as it were, working it out. Is it worth going down that pathway or not? It's reversible. That's the point. But sometimes, as you can see, it can go down through many generations. Now, why is this important? Not only because of demonstrating the transmission through so many generations of a non-DNA inherited mechanism, and remember it was an acquired characteristic in response to viral invasion, it's also precisely what Charles Darwin foresaw. Darwin was a Lamarckian. <laughs> and many people don't know that. In the origin of species, and this was pointed out by the great evolutionary, orthodox evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer, in his work in 1982, a seminal piece of work, but very much within the orthodox neo-Darwinist mold. There are at least 12 places in the origin of species where Charles Darwin points to the inheritance of acquired characteristics. He'd never criticized Lamarck on that particular issue. Indeed, he praised Lamarck in the preface to the fourth edition of The Origin of Species as this great biologist who championed the transformation uh, of species. Furthermore, if you go to a later book of Charles Darwin, his book on domestication in animals and plants, he invents a mechanism. He realizes that something has got to travel through the organism, perhaps through the bloodstream, which is what he thought, in order to convey to the germline that there's information about the soma having changed. He called them gemules. The RNAs are Darwin's gemules. He foresaw this. And what happened? Because of some tail-cutting experiments by August Weissmann in order to demonstrate that one of the wilder claims of Lamarckians in the 19th century was incorrect. That is, that if you surgically amputate tails or foreskins or whatever it might be, you eventually end up with organisms that lack tails or foreskins, that that was rubbish, and indeed it is rubbish. But the Lamarckian concept is not that a mutilation is inherited, it is that functionality is inherited. And that's the big difference, and Darwin accepted that. And it was neo-Darwinism. Remember that Darwinism is not neo-Darwinism. And neo-Darwinism is not Darwinism. It was neo-Darwinism, largely instigated by August Weissmann and, of course, by uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, that concluded that that kind of mechanism was impossible until, as I said earlier, Conrad Waddington showed that it is possible. This is another lovely example, in this case by actual genome marking. This is from the work of Joe Nadeau and his colleagues, working originally at the Systems Biology Institute in Seattle, but Joe Nadeau has now left that and is working uh, somewhere else uh, up in that part of the United States. They looked at transgenerational epigenetic effects of Apopec-1 deficiency. Don't worry about the technicality here if this is not your area. It's not mine either. Um, what they demonstrate, though, is that the effects persist for many generations. It doesn't die out. And it's as strong as conventional genetic inheritance. Now, I want to emphasize here, I'm not claiming that epigenetic effects do not die out. Remember I said earlier on that one of the great advantages of epigenetic change compared to DNA change is that you can reverse it much more easily. Organisms therefore can experiment, as it were, with their um, environments to find out what is suitable. But to the mantra, it never persists for a long time, it's quite clear that that is simply not true. And those who claim that uh, simply have not read the literature. And now I come to the icon of Darwinian evolution. 
the Galapagos finches. Skinner and his colleagues, Michael Skinner, um, in I, what I think is a landmark paper in 2014 in Genome Biology and Evolution, looked at the, well, five of the finch species with different phylogenetic distances, either very close <coughs> or quite distant. So they were able to measure the total number of DNA changes in the genomes and the total number of epigenetic changes and both occur. I mean, if you want to draw a correlation, it's actually better with the epigenetic change than with the DNA change. But I'm not going to insist on that because I checked with Michael Skinner and asked him, does that mean you think the epigenetic change came first? And he said, the trouble is we will never know. How could you know? You see, come back to Conrad Waddington. One of the things that he demonstrated with inheritance of acquired characteristics, he did this in fruit flies, is that it becomes genetically assimilated. He showed that that process can occur after about 14 generations of fruit flies. After that, you will see DNA change, even though that was not what happened initially. But you will not know what happened initially unless you actually did the experiment. And that's the problem with evolutionary biology, trying to look back. We have no idea what came first there. And what Michael Skinner says is simply, we don't need to know. All we really need to know is that an additional mechanism exists, contributes to speciation, and we do not know how to unravel fully the relevant contributions of the two forms. So now I come to genetic buffering. And indeed, this is to now refer to some of the work of my lab and its collaborators, where a number of years ago we developed, as David Eisen said, uh, some important computer models of the um, heart. And this one is showing rhythmic activity in a model experimentally based in the sinus node with just two of the membrane transporters involved, one contributing a large amount of current and one contributing a small amount and what we're doing is doing a knockout experiment which you can do on the model and what you find is that the um, knockout produces really quite a modest change in frequency and indeed with a functionality as important as the rhythm of the heart this is what you would expect but the one thing I want to emphasize here is this with a detailed experimental model, you can reverse engineer to work out what was going on. Because if you draw a line under the voltage traces in that simulation, you'll notice that there is a change which occurs as you knock out one component, which is that there's a modest degree of hyperpolarization. And that's sufficient to kick in the other mechanism, which is the um, hyperpolarizing activated current, which Dario Di Francesco, who's in this audience, um, discovered with Hilary Brown, who's also in this audience, and Susan Noble way back in 1979. That observation has two big significances. First, well three. First, that you can reverse engineer, but you need the understanding of the physiology in order to do that. You won't get this from genome information, however much you accumulate uh, genome sequence information, you won't get this understanding. Um, the second is that this was actually made the basis of uh, the development of a major drug, Eva Bradine, by the pharmaceutical company um, Servier. Um, it was what, in fact, led to Dario Di Francesco receiving the, um, the Foulon de la Lande prize by the Academy of Sciences in Paris just a few years ago. So that was honoured, and I think rightly so. But the third reason is this. This is what got me back into evolutionary biology. Because think about it. If you get an error in a knockout experiment to look at functionality, as much as the difference between 80% and 15%, that's pretty bad. But it gets worse. This is from the work of Hill and Mayer and his colleagues looking at a much smaller organism, yeast, where they were capable of producing mutations to practically all the genes involved, 6,000 of them. 
80% of the knockouts are silent. In the sense that there is no effect on the metabolism and reproduction of the organism. But that does not mean that the proteins that those genes form a template for are not functional. I mean, you can demonstrate that because as soon as you stress the organism, you reveal the functionality of most of that 80%. So it can be so bad that you can observe, as it were, zero function from a knockout, where you know that in fact there is function. And of course what is going on is what we as physiologists understand very well, just as the control system of an aircraft has backups, and hopefully your computer does too, um, nature has naturally found the way to back up many important functions. I want to finish by coming on to the role of physics in development as another area where I think there's major change occurring. And then I want to answer the question, um, why the lion's den? The way I see development, and I really do recommend those who have an opportunity to get Conrad Waddington's book, strategy of the genes just recently reprinted to read it because it's a joy to read how much insight that man had way back 60 years ago. One of the things that's very clear from Waddington's perspective is this. He incidentally was the inventor of the word epigenetics, although of course what he meant by epigenetics was not quite what we mean today. But I think we should respect his concept as much as the modern concept. His concept was that the networks that we analyze as physiologists themselves mediate between the genotype and the phenotype. And you cannot get around that. There is no direct route from a single gene to a functionality. Moreover, we know that the development of a whole variety of multicellular organisms initially looks very similar, and yet the genomes are very different. Now you can either say, okay, the genes that are involved in that early stage development just happen to be all the same in all of those organisms, or you can say, well, why can't nature get free rides from physics? If you've got a bunch of cells growing in a confined space, which is what's happening in development, they will eventually invaginate. And you don't need a genome program to tell them to do so. They will do so automatically. So gastrulation can occur. Of course it may have genomic base as well. I'm not arguing that it's all one rather than the other. I'm arguing that physics plays a role. This is a lovely paper by David Edelman and his colleagues uh, just recently published in Progress in Biophysics where they write that animal form may thus be seen as the product of physical forces or biases acting upon cells and populations with very specific and constrained geometric properties rather than arising solely from the vagaries of chance. So, the lion's den. What all of this did, of course, was to lead me to question uh, some of the established 20th century theory of evolutionary biology. And when I first started doing this, um, giving lectures all the way from about 2010 onwards, slowly developing the theme, the response from orthodox neo-Darwinists can only be described as outrage. Have a look at my Wikipedia page if you want examples of that. One of those that's expressed <laughs> great outrage is Jerry Coyne, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. He's the only one I will name because he's named himself, so much so that he appears on my Wikipedia page, well, my Wikipedia page, something that somebody's written for me. Um, and he writes, all his claims are wrong. Well, I could perhaps live with that. I think all claims, I mean, all theories in biology are wrong, when you think about it. I mean, they're all approximations to the truth. But that's not what he means, of course. Um, 
And he writes, however famous Noble may be in physiology, is a blundering tyro when it comes to evolutionary biology. Well, um, let's have a look. These are some of the quotes from the lion's roaring. Here we go again, somebody arguing that Darwin is wrong. Those of you who have listened carefully to this lecture so far will realise that I actually think that Darwin was largely right, and he was particularly <laughs> right in not excluding the inheritance of acquired characteristics and in praising Jean-Baptiste Lamarck as a great biologist. So I have no idea how on earth... Well, I do. Let me uh, explain why I think that bit of thinking arises. I think it arises because neo-Darwinism loves to claim that it's really just Darwinism writ large, as it were, and with 20th century insights like Mendelian genetics and, and so on, which of course is quite true and we nobody would want to deny that the incorporation of Mendelian genetics into evolutionary biology led to some very great advances. All the mathematics of population genetics would not occur or would not have occurred, I think, uh, with, without that. But there is a kind of political strategy here. You know, Darwin is up there as an icon, and if you can claim, as it were, that you are children of Charles Darwin, you're doing very well from the point of view of publicizing <coughs> your point of view. And I think that's the explanation. But it needs to be emphasized very clearly indeed that Darwin would not have recognized neo-Darwinism as his inheritance. The next one, his most moronic claim by far is the one on mutations not being random. Well, anybody who's listened to this lecture today could hardly go home thinking that I claim that mutations are not random. Actually, I do have a quibble. We don't actually, as physicists and mathematicians, fully understand how we would ever prove that mutations are really random. We can say they appear random, and that's fine enough, I think. Um, but it's not enough for a very simple reason. Not only do we not actually understand fully the mechanisms in the physical world that generate randomness, we understand some of them, but by no means all, um, it's also that if randomness is used, you may not see that at the level of genes and molecules. See, come back to the gas in a container. Imagine just a moment that gas is the molecules that bounce around in the cell. And from the viewpoint of a molecule, if it was represented as about this sort of size, the edge of the cell would be way back up in Aberdeen. The constraint is that very distant edge. You won't see that in the bouncing around of the molecules at the molecular level. Of course, once you've got the insight that there is a boundary, there is a constraint, you can then say, OK, we now understand that this has a particular pressure, it has a particular volume, uh, and so on. But the idea that I claim that Mutations are not random. Well, enough said. I know of not a single adaptation in organisms that is based on such environmentally induced and non-genetic change. You better read the literature, is my <laughs> comment on that one. And I finish this particular sequence of the lion's roaring. Um, cells are transitive and DNA is not. That's taken, of course, straight from the selfish gene. You can only maintain that if you have a very strange view of DNA and its replicative ability. Incidentally, it's the strange view that Schrödinger had. And if somebody wants me during discussion to go through the detail of Schrödinger's error, I'm very happy to do so. It's in the new book, uh, Dance to the Tune of Life, and I think it's the first time that the full analysis of that error has been published. Um, so Cambridge University Press, you've got a, you've got a first on that, um, <laughs> at least on that particular issue. Now, the point is this. The natural error rate in copying is 1 in 10 to the 4. 
in a genome of three billion base pairs, that's millions. What actually happens is one in ten to the ten. Hardly a single error in copying a whole genome. How is that done? A whole army of proteins constrained by the lipids, which are not coded for, incidentally, by uh, DNA, orchestrates the correction so that you end up with the extraordinary fidelity of copying. The ability to be, as it were, not transient is a property of the cell. There is nothing other than a cell that enables that to be done. I think enough said on that one. So, I'm afraid at the meeting last week they met with a stone wall. And so I finish with my final conclusion, and I've left just a few minutes for discussion. Um, the conclusion is simply this, that organisms can and do, and demonstrably do, harness stochasti stochasticity precisely in order to generate functionality, and that turns the neo-Darwinist synthesis on its head. The central claim, remember, is random mutations uh, accumulating slowly and then natural selection to distinguish between the results. If, on the contrary, you can harness stochasticity to direct it in particular ways, just as the immune system does, just as bacteria do when they're starved, um, or deprived of their um, cilia and so on, you can end up with the evolutionary process being directional. And that is a huge change. We're not talking about tinkering with the modern synthesis. We're not talking about minor changes to the neo-Darwinist synthesis. We're talking about a very major change conceptually. And the implications for economics, for political theory, for various other disciplines, philosophy included, that have taken over, and believe me, they have, the price equation and all the various other mathematics of um, evolutionary biology are absolutely immense. Those equations are going to have to be revised, and we're going to have to take account of the fact that there can be directionality, and that nature has obtained free ride from physics as much as chemistry. So, just a bit of further reading. The first article there, which was published in the Journal of Physiology, um, demonstrates that the selfish gene theory is of no empirical use whatsoever in physiological investigation. And there has been no answer to that article. It's been published now for five years. The second is the one that really got the lions roaring, which was published in, again, a journal of the Physiological Society, Experimental Physiology. Physiology is rocking the foundations of evolutionary biology. Actually, that idea, that, that title, was taken from the commentary in the PNAS article which published Joe Nadeau's work on the Apebec-1 deficiency transmission of epigenetic uh, information. The commentary article simply said that um, his work was rocking the foundations of genetics. Then a major issue of the Journal of Physiology, I think I had one just a minute or two ago, but I think it's downstairs, a few copies of it, which was devoted just two years ago to the um, focused theme that evolution evolves. And um, finally, the article that, as it were, led to the writing of Dance to the Tune of Life, which has just been published, um, which is in the Journal of Experimental Biology, Evolution Beyond Neo-Darwinism. And I end the lecture with this quote, that nature is even more wondrous than the architects of the modern synthesis thought, and it involves processes previously believed impossible. Physiology is back, and it's back with a vengeance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going to suggest we take a few...
few questions now, and then perhaps you do more informally. Yes, indeed. I think, that's however, right. speaking yeah. to a group of physiologists, you're going to find their pussy cats rather than lions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, the lions also weren't particularly lion-like last week, but that's another story. <laughs> Who'd like to kick off? Satisfied your audience, Peter. <coughs> Marvelous lecture. Well, thank you for coming from you. <laughs> it's always it's always great to see the development of these ideas, um, part of which I witnessed more closely than the last five years. I think. Now, I would like to challenge you on one of your claims, please. And that is that a molecule of this size would encounter its first barrier in MD. I think that is probably not the case because cells are so highly structured. Yes. Absolutely. I totally agree, and I know where you're going. Please go on. So not just cardiac <laughs> uh, Indeed, but yes. But bacterial cells, yeah. enzymes, sit on uh, cytoskeletal elements. They are constrained in space. Absolutely. And if that wasn't the case, the, uh, most of the signals the cell uses, the cell uses in so many different contexts, the calcium, for example, um, has a temporal and a concentration and a spatial dependence in coming back to cardiac cells, it changes in amplitude, as David knows, uh, so vividly that it could not possibly control yeah. enzyme activity or, or um, genetic information if every part of the cell saw the same signal. Yes. Now, that is a very interesting point, because about three years ago in Interface Focus, I did a very interesting calculation, because I took what you're saying very seriously, which is this. Can you calculate not just the total information in the genome, we know it's three billion base pairs, so that's fairly straightforward, you can regard those as the zeros and ones. But I then ask the question, assuming, as you're indicating, that we must take a certain degree of resolution of three-dimensional structure, how much information would there be in that cell that stretches out to Aberdeen? It's at least three billion. So your point is well taken, and it gives me the opportunity to emphasize that point, and all of that is inherited. Absolutely. So I agree. But much of it is also done by physics. Yes, exactly so. Yes, and that is inherited too. You don't need to well, you do. well, you do. It's sort of self-templating, isn't it? I mean, yes, because I think, you see, that while we have, of course, a, a replication mechanism for DNA, we don't need a replication mechanism of the same kind for the rest, but it's still replicating, it's self-templating, and I think that needs to be emphasized. So it just doesn't make sense to say there's only one replicator in cells. In some respects, what you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is the, the sort of bond synthesis was a reasonable first approximation, it was a yeah. jolly useful set of ideas within its own limitations at the time, but guess what? We've learned an awful lot in the last 50 or so years. And you might have thought that, you know, genuine scientists would be rather thrilled to find, to find this out. Yeah. And somehow that message hasn't yet percolated into the culture. And I wonder whether what your thoughts are, other than these excellent lectures, which are to some extent preaching to the choir, how it can get into the culture. Yes, I think that's absolutely right because I think it's important to emphasize that certainly I but I'm pretty certain I'm speaking for nearly all the other speakers at the Royal Society meeting last week would not claim that the neo-Darwinist mechanism does not work it is that it is not sufficient it's not unique and I remember a debate that I chaired between Lynn Margulis, the originator of the, well not the originator, she would often claim that she was not the originator of symbiogenesis, but she certainly was the person who brought it on to the um, scene in no uncertain way. Um, she debated with Richard Dawkins in 2009 in a seminal debate that went on for about four hours and it's recorded on the website of Voices from Oxford and there was a very interesting exchange at one point about three hours into the debate I chaired that debate Victorian sermons well four or three hours yes <laughs> anyway um, to come back to the point at one point Richard says to 
Lynn Margulis, and this is in the transcript and it's in the recording. You know, Lynn, I don't understand. You see, there's blind chance and then there's natural selection. Why on earth would you ever want to drag in symbiogenesis? And Lynn's response was, Richard, it is there. <laughs> it exists, which is the beginning of all science. And I totally agree, Nicholas. There's no sense in which anybody, at least not me, is claiming that the neo-Darwinist mechanism doesn't work. Um, I'm simply saying that it's not sufficient. Moreover, we don't know, if we're honest, what the relative contributions have been of the different mechanisms that we now know. Go back to Michael Skinner's work on the Galapagos finches. His point is you won't be able unless you had extraordinarily detailed information on the precise evolutionary changes over many, many generations, you won't be able to work out how the epigenetic and genetic changes interacted because they interact, and you can't avoid that. And so I think one should simply say we're going towards a much more nuanced position, which doesn't deny, as you say, Nicholas, doesn't deny the existence of the modern synthesis mechanism, but simply says it's nowhere near sufficient. Moreover, it goes further in the following sense, and I emphasize what I said at the end of the lecture, which is that if you introduce directionality to evolution, that is a change with huge implications for the humanities the social sciences, economics and philosophy. And that was also demonstrated because the meeting last week was not just a meeting of the Royal Society, it was also a meeting of the British Academy, which the essentially those presenting on the implications for and the work that is relevant from evolutionary biology in the humanities and social sciences were saying, this makes much more sense to us. And it's fairly obvious because it means that you understand the role of cultural evolution, how it can interact with genetic evolution. You know, there are beautiful examples of that. Mice and rats stroking their young convey information to the young that affects their health and disease states right the way down through the generations. How does it do it? It's not just cultural in the sense that the mice or the rats remember when they're old that stroking does good to their children, it is that the genome is actually marked in the hippocampus in the region that partly influences that kind of effective behavior. Again, they interact. In this case, it's cultural evolution interacting with the biological mechanisms. It changes one's perception in a very, very important way. And that's the reason why I feel this is a mission. It's a mission to change the way in which, not, as it were, what the facts are about biology, though I think quite a lot has come out recently that demonstrates the detailed mechanisms of many of the processes that were outlined 60 or 70 years ago by the pioneers like uh, McClintock and, and Waddington and others. But what it does do is to give great body of experimental evidence to ideas that were rubbished, and believe me, they were. If Conrad Waddington had not been rubbished, we would have a more nuanced view of evolutionary biology today, and that was 60 years ago. If Barbara McClintock had not been ignored for something like 30 years, we would have got to understanding the response of organisms to stress in the way in which they change their genomes much quicker. It matters. That's the point I'm making. So, yes, um, don't remember what the question was now, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've Perhaps said enough. Yes. So, so yes. This, yes. this lecture was set up whilst my predecessor, Richard Vaughan Jones, was president, so I'd like to ask Richard to end the formal proceedings with a vote of thanks. So thank you very much, David. Thank you, Dennis, uh, for a lovely lecture. Um, as David pointed out, I was the outgoing president of the Physiological Society when we thought about this lecture and decided that it would be appropriate to invite Dennis to give a lecture. Uh, and I'm delighted to give the vote of thanks because Dennis and I have known each other for about 40 years. It's frightening for me to say. 
Um, and I was present when Dennis in Oxford retired from full-time academic work. I think that was about 13 years ago. And the university at that time invited Dennis to present uh, an honorary, as it were, valedictory lecture, which was held in the side business school. And at the end of that lecture, Den Dennis said to me, I'm not doing this again. And I was really quite shocked to hear this. Uh, I mean, this was a man who had just given a brilliant lecture, as he has done today. And so I said, you mean... You don't, you're not going to give any more lectures? We won't benefit from anything. He says, oh, no, no, no I'll give lectures. I'm just not retiring again. <laughs> um, it's too much work. I've never been so busy. Now, that was 13 years, dozens of lectures, several scientific papers, and two books ago. So, Dennis, long may you remain retired so that we will benefit from uh, the originality of your ideas and also your fervent support for causes that you believe are right. And so I think that we've had an elegant lecture clearly presented. As always with, with your presentations, Dennis, uh, they're controversial and they're challenging, but long should they be because this is science. So it's a heartfelt um, appreciation that I convey from myself and from those in the audience and from the Physiological Society, which we like to think is your academic home. So we're welcoming you home to our new premises uh, in Hodgkin Huxley House. So thank you very much and please join your hands together to uh, thank Dennis for a wonderful lecture.